The Gospel reading from the lectionary passages today is from the Gospel of John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. Listen to God's word as it comes to us from the writer of the Gospel and by God's Spirit, a living word for us today. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward had tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but but you, you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, as we ponder your word by the power of your spirit, speak that we too might believe, we pray in your holy name. Amen. You know, if I had been there that day, I mean, if if, if only I had been there, well, I can tell you what, what would have happened within the next few days. I would have caught up with Jesus again on on his journey, asked him to follow me, and I would have taken him to the largest vacant warehouse that I had rented there in Cana, the bigger, the better. And I'd open the door of that warehouse, and there on the floor, standing wall to wall and shoulder to shoulder with, with small aisles between the rows would have been every stone jar, every pottery container, every jug, every pot, every vessel I could beg, borrow, rent, or purchase, all of them full to the brim of water. And I, and I would have opened the door and I would have ushered Jesus in and I said, okay, do your stuff, man. <laughs> I mean, we could fund the ministry until the cows come home or, or the sheep come home. Maybe it was a bit more appropriate. I would also just let him know that I had conveniently rented the shop right across the street and and showed him the few floor plans that I'd sort of sketched out on a piece of paper of the nicest little wine bar conveniently located right there in the neighborhood. If, If I had been there that day, that's probably what I would have done, and it would have been all wrong. John's Gospel calls these kinds of events signs, not miracles. And if you know anything about John's Gospel, his typical presentation of of Jesus and and these kind of events, there, there are layers of meaning probably underneath to be unearthed. And, and for instance, using using the, the stone water jars that were used for the ritual of purification for the Jews in the household. Perhaps Jesus wanted those people, maybe even still wants us to reorient our thinking about what's clean and what's unclean, the thing that these jars signified. And maybe even the fact that he was doing it right there in the middle of a wedding where everybody in the town was likely to be in the house. Maybe it would be a rethinking about the fact that all humanity are really clean in the eyes of God welcomed with hospitality. Theologians argue about those kinds of interpretations of Scripture, 
have since the beginning and will continue to, but, but whatever range of things this particular sign or any of these signs might symbolize, signs always point beyond themselves to a larger reality. They're signs. They're, they're not done for themselves. They, they have a bigger purpose. They have an intent behind them. I mean, Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, but he didn't then turn around and open up a chain of long john silvers. <laughs> Jesus healed 10 lepers, but he didn't then start a dermatology clinic right there on the hillside. It, he calmed the raging waters with a few words, but then didn't show up in the port the next day and hire himself out to the highest bidding captain to do the seafaring with him for the rest of the season. Jesus was never revealing his power in order to change livelihoods or give people lottery-winning riches. It was always to change hearts, to engage people with their very reason for being, their raison d'etre, the, their relationship with God, the Creator. Which is a good reminder to us, Jesus didn't come to fix everything that, that was broken, didn't come to heal every wound, improve construction protocols, or enhance communication, or eradicate every disease. John tells us why Jesus did this sign. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. A sign so they would believe in him. Throughout his ministry, that happened with Jesus, and it still happens today. After all, Christianity is a re revealed religion. It is the nature of Jesus to constantly be unveiling and revealing himself to us. Sometimes that revelation comes to us in a way that is clear and distinct and unmistakable. Other times, we, you know, we receive just hints or, or suggestions, subtle indications that God is near, that God is for us. But I'm convinced since the beginning of time, God loves you and me enough to give us signs. And there are signs that appear often in everyday life, signs to show us the way to God and the ways of God. Martin Luther King Jr. was not one to share much at all about his private, personal faith, his, his spiritual journey, his prayer life. He spoke very little about his engagement with the Holy One, but he did write about one Friday night in January of 1956. And at that time, he was still a very reluctant prophet. Rosa Parks had decided to sit in a different place on the bus than she was supposed to, and the bus boycott, which was supposed to just last a couple days and make a point, had gone on for weeks, and the city was angry. And Martin was terrified. Threats were coming. And he came home one night from a meeting. His wife Coretta was asleep, and he wandered around in the kitchen, made a cup of coffee, and, and realized, I'm exhausted. I cannot do this. I do not have the strength. How is it? Can I slip out of this predicament and just go away without appearing to be fearful or having no courage, and he put his head down on the kitchen table and prayed, Oh God, I cannot do this. And he writes, A divine presence came over me I had never experienced. And a voice spoke inside and said, Stand firm. Stand up for justice. I will be with you. The only sign he wrote about 
but it changed his life and our world. One of the joys as as a pastor is is the privilege of hearing those stories from people all the time, all along the way. This past Tuesday, as as we do every year, we had a joint meeting. Incoming officers shared their faith statements with joint meeting of elders and deacons. It's always a holy time. They're powerful statements. We're privileged to hear all of them, but, but two individuals shared with us their own epiphanies as they talked about their faith journey. Signs in their lives, moments of revelation from years ago. One happened while an individual I think was around age 12. The other one I'm guessing was probably in their, in their 20s, maybe early 30s. One, the first was, was at a youth gathering and, and, and This person says, I was seated off to the side by myself, wasn't really engaged with what was going on, and suddenly there was a brightness. And I was filled with this sense of warmth. And then it passed. But what remained was this overwhelming sense of being loved. A sense of well-being, a knowledge that the Holy Spirit had visited me. It changed that person's life. The other was at a a small country church, and and this individual had had been asked to basically be a chauffeur to drive a a, a friend to to the church meeting, this little church meeting, and it was going to be a hymn sing, but... Got there, and the, and the friend actually convinced the driver, oh, come on in, just, you know, you don't know, sit in a car or have to come by, just come on in, and, 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 and reluctantly, you know, came in and off to the side while the congregation sang and, and, and you know, describes himself as, as, you know, watching and listening to, you know, people he didn't know and <laughs> didn't really want to know, you know, was grumpy and put out and... It happened. This infilling of warmth and a sense of Christ in his heart that he'd never known before was changed. Signs are given for a purpose. You know, maybe it, it won't happen to either one of those individuals again. But they were changed, and, and they believe they're actually officers now in the life of this congregation. And those things don't happen to everyone, but, but it's happened, I guarantee you, to somebody you know. <laughs> More importantly, somebody you know who's not crazy. And maybe on the basis of what they have seen, what they have felt, you too, are drawn to believe. I was telling my father about that meeting, and he said, Don, your great-grandfather, Alva, <laughs> wife Josie, and asked him to take her to the Billy Sunday meeting. And he's like, I don't want to go to that. Just, just take us. Okay, I'll drive you there. You don't know Billy Sunday, the old evangelism sawdust trail. So Alva drove Josie and a couple of the kids to the meeting. And, you know, well, just come on in and sit. You know, I know I'm not going to as well. Just sit in the back and wait and we'll come home with him. And he, and he told my father one day, he said, you know, I have no clue what the preacher said. But in the middle of that message, this overpowering sense that I needed to get up and go down that aisle because God was speaking to me. Signs come for a reason. Given for a purpose. Maybe that one was so that a great grandson might one day trust a mighty God. That wedding at Cana, you know, it, it, it wasn't It wasn't about the wine. 
It was about believing and trusting in Jesus. Sometimes does, God does something a little out of the ordinary to catch our eye, to get our attention, to let us know God is present to us or someone we know or someone we love. But, but every now and then, it, I mean, it doesn't happen often. Otherwise, my guess is we'd be looking for one every day, like every hour. Okay, God, you know, come on. And if you're anything like me, you know, you start filling warehouses with jars. It just... The Gospels record around 36 miracles or signs of Jesus. In three years, that's like one a month. It's not a lot. But it was enough for 12 to believe that day. And enough for them to share what they had seen, what they had heard. For generation, generation. Every now and then they come along, God's little gifts, signs that you and I might believe. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.